Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Educate. Today we're going to be talking about the biodiversity of animals. We're doing part two. Remember what makes the bodies of animals to be different. It is the body symmetry, cephalization, tissue layers. So in our previous video, we did these three things. So today we're just going to be talking about the number of gut openings as well as the presence of the body cavity stay tuned so if you did not understand the first two factors watch our previous video i'll post the link in the description so ladies and gentlemen let us talk about the number of gut openings so first of all when we're talking about gut openings we are talking about the holes or the openings that open into the digestive system of an animal for example as a human being you have got a mouth so this mouth opens up into your digestive system. I'm sure you know that the digestive system opens through the mouth and then the other opening is the anus. So for example, humans have got two gut openings, which is the mouth for the entry of food and the anus for the exit of waste from the digested food. So when we're talking about gut openings, we're just talking about the openings that allow food to enter into the body and allow food to the waste from the food to exit from the body. So the number of gut openings is another factor that differentiates a particular animal's body. So in other ways, we're trying to say that other animals do not have the same number of openings as other animals do. So for example, I've said that humans have got two gut openings, which is the mouth, so that the food can enter through the mouth. When it enters through the mouth, the waste from the food exists through the anus. So those are the two gut openings. So let us talk first of the blind gut. So the blind gut um, is when some animals have got only one opening so when you say only one opening it means the animal has got only a mouth it does not have an anus so for example the animal will be something like this um and then let us just say this is the mouth of the animal so the food enters through the mouth and also the food the waste exists uh, exits through the mouth so this means that this animal has got only one opening so we say that is a blind gut so these animals will consume food through the mouth and they will also excrete waste through the same opening the mouth so can you imagine that an animal is eating food using the mouth and at the same time it is excreting the waste from the food using the mouth so it means that there will be a limited amount of food that these animals can consume because you cannot consume food continuously because you have to excrete its waste out of the body hence we say that the blind gut has got a disadvantage because it limits the amount of food that these animals can consume because they must excrete the waste from the digestive system before they can consume more food so right now if this animal eats it has to wait for the stomach to digest and after digesting this food has to be excreted from the mouth again so that more food can be can enter through the mouth or can be consumed hence we say that the amount of food that enters into the animal is limited because they have to excrete the waste as well as um, excrete the waste from the same mouth that they use to consume the food so when you say that you've got a blind gut just remember that we've got only one opening which is the mouth and then the next one the second type is called the throat gut so when you say animals have got a throat gut it means that they've got an opening for the consumption of food as well as an opening for the excretion of waste just like humans so humans have got a throat gut so it means in this way uh, most of the times they will show you a drawing like this let's just say this is the animal there is a mouth here this is the opening where food gets inside the animal so this is the mouth and the animal is eating through the mouth right and then the waste from the food will be excreted through the anus 
So here, the through gut, uh, yeah, the through gut, it means we've got two openings whereby we've got an opening so that food can enter into the body and we've got an opening so that the waste from the food can leave through the anus. So we say this is a through gut. So a through gut is very advantageous because the food can be consumed continuously. Remember that in comparison to the blind gut, the food was limited because the food has to enter in the same opening and uh, the, the waste has to also leave from the very same opening. Hence, we have to wait for this uh, digestive system to process the food. And when the waste is excreted, we can only now increase the food we eat. But then when we have got a through gut, the food can be consumed continuously because there is another separate opening for the waste to be excreted. Just like in humans, you can continue to eat and consume more food, but uh, because there is another opening which uh, will excrete the waste from the food, unlike a blind gut. I hope that is understood. So this opening has got specialized organs such as the stomach. So when you've got a through gut, we've got other specialized organs such as the stomach, which makes the process of digestion to be more efficient and more easy. So the stomach, for example, in humans, remember we've got something like this, an esophagus, and we've got a stomach here and some intestines and whatnot. So here, these specialized organs develop in animals which have got a through gut. That is the animals which have got an opening for the entry of food or consuming of food and also an opening so that the waste can come out from the body of the animal. So those are the two types of guts that we have. So now we go to the other characteristic that makes the bodies of animals to be different, which is the presence of a body cavity. So what is a body cavity? So a body cavity is actually known as a coelom. I'm sure you have heard your teacher mention the word silom and you have not understood what it say, what it means. So a silom develops inside the mesoderm tissue in more advanced animals. So animals are acylomate when they do not have a silom. So here a silom is sort of just something that develops inside the mesoderm of an animal. So remember, this image is just to tell you what, which part is the mesoderm. So these are the germ layers of an animal, or rather of an embryo. So if you did not understand the concept of germ layers, I still recommend you to watch our first video explaining what are tissue layers. So here, this opening in the middle, which I painted in green, is known as the mesoderm. So in the mesoderm, that is where this body cavity known as a coelom develops. So what is this um, uh, body cavity doing? Well, what organ is it developing? So let us look in more of it. So we have got organisms that are acylomate. When you've got organisms that are acylomate, it means that um, those ones do not have a coelom. So acylomate animals can be diploblastic or triploblastic. Remember when you say that they are diploblastic, it means that they've got two layers. They've got two germ layers, which is the ectoderm as well as the endoderm. They do not have a mesoderm. Hence, they will not have a coelom because the coelom has to develop inside the mesoderm. So here, from this passage, I've said that the coelom develops inside the mesoderm tissue of advanced animals. So when the animals are diploblastic, they do not have a mesoderm, hence they will not have a coelom. So that's why I said acylomate animals may be either diploblastic or triploblastic. So some of them have got a mesoderm, the triploblastic animals, but then they do not have a coelom. So all of those are called acylomate. So acylomate animals are usually smaller and they are less mobile than coelomates. So this tells us that the coelom plays a role in the size of an animal. So the animals that are acylomate, meaning that those animals in their, uh, in their germ layers, they do not have um, a coelom in their mesoderm, then those ones are what? They are smaller and they are also what? They are also 
less mobile when you say that an animal is less mobile it means it does not move a lot it is less active just like a flatworm a flatworm is a silomate so if you can look at the size of a flatworm it is very small as well and a flatworm is not that active or mobile it is because it is a silomate so now we go to the silomates so an animal is silomate because it has got a silom right which is the body cavity so remember that uh, a silom occurs only in triploblastic animals as i've already said that triploblastic animals have got three germ layers which is the endoderm the mesoderm as well as the ectoderm so these are the three germ layers the ectoderm the mesoderm as well as the endoderm so the silom will develop here in the mesoderm of the animal so here the silom made animals are triploblastic meaning that their embryos or their babies they've got what they've got three germ layers so under silomate we've got two types of silomates we've got the pseudo silomate and we've got just a silomate you don't have to say just silomate you can just say silomate the other one is a pseudo silomate so when you're talking about a pseudo silomate and a silomate how different are they all of them have got a silom so what how does a silom looks like you can see this white thing this is a silom so this white thing that you're noticing here it is your it is your silom so this white thing is your silom which is in in the what which is in the mesoderm you can see that this is uh, the ectoderm this part in blue is the ectoderm and then the red part is the mesoderm as well as the inner part the yellow part is the endoderm so the silom is the one painted in white so the difference between a silomate just a silomate and a pseudo silomate is that um in a pseudo silomate these have got a silom indeed but that silom is not surrounded by the mesoderm what is it trying to say so in pseudo silomate you can see that this is a pseudo silomate this is the silom which we are talking about the white part is the silom so can you see that the silom is not surrounded by the mesoderm what am i trying to say by that remember that again this is the ectoderm the blue one then the mesoderm is the red one and then we have got an endoderm inside so the silom is the white part so if you can notice the difference between these two is that this white part which is the silom is inside the mesoderm what do i mean by inside it means it is completely surrounded by the mesoderm if you can see this is the silom here let me use um, a highlighter so here it is you can see that this is your silom here in the silomate one you can see that uh, at the sides of the silom all you can see is a red layer which is the mesoderm so we can say that it is completely surrounded by the mesoderm so that's a silomate organism but then in a pseudo silomate organism the silom which is this white part it is not surrounded by the red layer we can only see the red layer on only one side which is this side which i'm pointing at but then the other side there is no red part so it is not inside the mesoderm it is not surrounded completely by the mesoderm i hope you understand that a silomate all of them have got siloms all of them are actually silomate but then we can actually differentiate them another one is pseudo silomate another one is just silomate the pseudo silomate one it means that the silom this white thing the body cavity it is not surrounded completely by the mesoderm meaning that um the mesoderm is just outside the silom here it is outside whereas a silomate the white part which is the silom here is within this red layer so that's the difference between pseudo silomate as well as silomate so now what is the whole point of having a silom what is a silom so a silom remember that it is developing in the mesoderm so it is developing in the embryos remember in the babies which are still in the pregnant wombs and whatnot so that silom what role does it play 
in making a baby. So in an animal, there are advantages that a silom has. So a silom allows more complex organs to develop. So which complex organs are we referring to here? We are referring to the digestive organs. Digestive organs, we're talking about the stomach, the small intestines, the duodenum, all of those things that take part in the digestive system, as well as also the muscular system. So the, an, an animal that has got muscles in its body, it is due to the presence of a silom. So it means that the silom developed those organs right and also a blood system so we're not talking about a blood system remember we talk about the blood some animals do not have blood so it means that they do not they did not have a silom at birth if they had a silom when they were being made inside the wombs of their mothers then they would have developed a blood system so the functions of a silom is to do what is to develop those complex organs digestive organs muscular system as well as the blood system that's the first function then the next function of a silom a silom allows for the creation of a hydrostatic force to be generated for the movement in soft bodied animals so for other animals which are soft bodied they really use, they have got what we call a hydroskeleton most of the times. So those which have got a hydroskeleton, like an earthworm, for example, um, an earthworm needs, needs water. It has got like water inside it so that it can move. So that's a hydrostatic skeleton. So that force within the water that allows it to move, it is what is called a hydrostatic force. So that hydrostatic force can only develop when there is a silom. So when you've got soft-bodied animals, they need a hydrostatic force within them so that they can be mo they can move. So for them to move, they need a hydrostatic force as well. So that hydrostatic force is being developed from a silom. Then the third function of a silom, it separates the endoderm and the ectoderm from each other with a cavity which allows layers to move independently of each other. This allows peristalsis to occur. So now tell you about the separation of the endoderm and ectoderm. Remember that in our image here, we have got here an endoderm and inside we've got an, um, we've got here an endoderm inside an ectoderm here. So when they say silom here, it allows for the separation of these two layers. So when these two layers are separated, there will be uh, peristalsis will be able to, okay. So peristalsis is further discussed in the process of the digestive system. But then the, the whole point of a silom being here, it is to separate these two parts. When these two parts are separated, then the layers will be able to move independently of each other. So this is the third function of a silom. Then the fourth and the last function of a silom is that in some organisms, the silomic fluid, the fluid that is found inside the silom, helps to transport nutrients and waste in the body. So for the animals that have got a silom, this silom here, it has got a certain fluid inside it. So that fluid helps in the transportation of nutrients as well as waste, excretion of waste from the body. So I hope you understand those two characteristics. Remember that we were discussing the last two characteristics, the number of gut openings, which is the number of openings into the digestive system, as well as the presence of a body cavity. So I hope that you understand this video and uh, please comment if you've got any questions and guess what? I've got an activity for you here. Just comment your answers. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Tell your friends to stay tuned.